All right, so Kyle, Alok, and I are going to present uh, this. Uh, the topic of today is how we uh, have a transition mechanism while uh, moving over our enterprise to our IPv6. And we are doing that without using any NATing device. So how do we do that? So uh, let's establish why we need to do this. So Netflix has a large um, ecosystem of microservices. We use hundreds of thousands of instances in Amazon uh, AWS EC2. Um, we have architected our network to use um, a, a flat IP space, so our networks don't have overlapping seeders, even though we've partitioned our network across multiple VPCs. Now, because of the way we've implemented our network, um, we are hitting scaling limits because of our consumption of IP addresses in AWS. And now many enterprises do have some alternatives to um, get rid of uh, you know, this kind of uh, scaling limits by having different kinds of segmentation. Uh, but due to the way we've architected our network, uh, for us, the um, only alternative is to move to IPv6. And when you know enterprises move to think of moving to IPv6, uh, the first thing that comes up is, um, um, why don't we dual stack um, all the devices with a v4 and v6 server? So in the last slide, I spoke about scaling limits. The reason dual stack doesn't help us is because we will reach those scaling limits even faster when we dual stack. So obviously that's something we don't want to do. And also as uh, network engineers, we want to change the network without application um, engineers noticing it and it being very seamless. So the question is now, how do we move from IPv4 to IPv6 uh, transparently? And here is a graph uh, that shows um, while we were developing this transition mechanism, uh, how the network flows within Netflix have been moving to predominantly IPv6. We've, um, we have, our goal here is to make this entire graph turn red by having all IPv6 flows uh, within Netflix. So when we move to v4 to v6, what is the state of the art to do implement um, this mechanism? Uh, you all guessed it, it's network address translation. So um, for the network address translation will translate uh, IPv4 to IPv6. There, there are some uh, state of the art mechanisms to use uh, NAT, we want a simple NAT here, just convert the v4 to v6. There are software modules to do this, like Tega. Then there's also, of course, you can buy a BP box where you can send out your network connections out of the box, out of AWS, uh, gets into this dedicated hardware and then comes out with a v6 address. Um, of course, all these uh, you know mechanisms have this singular um, uh, problem, which is like per packet processing. And apart from the latency and additional hardware, um, this per packet processing, um, uh, can be tedious. So can we do any better? So that's where TSA comes in. And Kyle? Thanks to your team. Yeah, if we know we want IPv6 only as our solution, how are we going to get there? TSA is the solution that we've come up with. TSA is short for the Titus syscall agent. And to define that, we're going to define Titus. Titus is Netflix's multi-tenant container platform. It's, it's kind of like Kubernetes, where we control uh, different containers on an individual host. And we run lots of them on a host. Shared kernel, though. The TSA, the, the Titus syscall agent, protects our shared host because we don't know, we don't really trust what other uh, workloads are running, but it also enables new capabilities. For example, TSA enables the perf command, so people in their containers can run perf safely because TSA is intercepting that perf syscall mutating it to make sure it's only capturing what's in the, their own container and they can't accidentally or on purpose try to performance or get performance counters from some other process. Same with the BPF syscall. Perp uses the BPF syscall anyway. But that's not what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about the TSA intercepting the connect syscall because we're talking about networking today. But it just goes, it's just one example of the power of being able to intercept and manipulate syscalls on a host in a shared environment. But to, in order to talk about how it does that, uh, we have to look at some, some, some different examples of how we intercept syscalls. Um, because there's a couple different ways. One way you might think to do this is with LD preload. This is kind of a non-starter for us because we don't really control the workload. It doesn't work with static binaries. It's, it's kind of out there. Kernel modules is another approach. You could certainly just write your kernel module and do anything you want. But uh, as, as, as Linux, Linux Palmer's knows, kernel modules they, they can be a little hard to write and a little hard to iterate on. And um, you don't want to crash the whole kernel just because something goes wrong with one individual container. It'd be nice if we had some protection. There's a couple other methods, but the method we're going to talk about today is SecComp, secure computing, which isn't 
you know, at first glance, you don't think of it as a, a way to manipulate syscalls. Uh, it's mostly, you know, it's, it's like a firewall for syscalls. You allow or deny, but there's a couple other things you can do. Starting in 2017, there's a new method, a new, a new thing you can do, which is to notify. So not just allow, not just deny, but a third option, notify, which sends that syscall on to another process listening on a socket to do something else. And then most recently in 2020, thanks to Sargon, who's a, a team member of ours, added and upstreamed the ability for the setcomp notifier to add a file descriptor in its response. So now we're really talking. Now we can intercept a syscall, do something, and then reply back with a file descriptor with more stuff. And that's going to be the secret sauce that powers Connect, but it also powers Perfin and BPF. <laughs> Let's look at some complex sequence diagrams to really get a feel for what's actually happening beneath the hood. And then we'll do a demo to show off this, this program. On the left hand, left most side, you see Titus. That's our orchestration thing. That's the thing that's actually launching these containers. And because it's launching the containers, it's got the hook. It can install the setcomp policy as we need. And even before TSA, we we're installing setcomp policies for security reasons. But with TSA now, we have the thir that third option, which is to continue with the notify with adding FD. So when Titus sets up the container, it sets up that special setcom policy. It get, gets back the notification FD that it needs to uh, respond to with the uh, in, incoming syscalls, specifically the ones what, that we're controlling, which are connect and perf and BPF. It, through uh, SCM writes, sends that notification file descriptor onto TSA, which is a separate process running per container, so they're isolated, but they're set up to intercept these syscalls and operate on them on their behalf. When the container is actually launched uh, and it actually makes a syscall, a actual syscall, that syscall, syscall does go to the kernel like normal, but because of the special set comp policy, it gets sent over to TSA to be handled. TSA can do a couple of things. It can just send it right back and say, this is good to go, but it can also get a chance to make that syscall on the, the server's behalf, so on the container's behalf and then return with a continue or uh, an add FD optionally. And, and that's the magic that allows us to take a syscall, do something different, return a file descriptor back to the container for it to continue to do whatever it needs to do. But how does this all, how does this all work with, in the context of networking? Because we're just talking about uh, syscalls and file descriptors. We haven't really talked about like IP addresses or anything. So, how does this magical thing interact with actual v4 and v6 servers? Cool. Thanks, guys. So on the left-hand side, we have a IPv6 container container having a v6 address. So that's a IPv6 client. Now, as Kyle was talking about, so we've added a SecCom filter. So this container will be able to send its um, all its system calls or some system calls to TSA. So when the IPv6 client wants to talk to an IPv6 server, which is like the happy path we're gonna talk about here, it issues the connect call. The connect call is gonna be intercepted by TSA because of the SecCom filter. Now TSA checks if it's a valid v6 destination. And in this case, it knows that it can, the v6 client can talk to the v6 server by itself and it gets out of the way, returns the response. And from then on, you know, the IPv6 client is talking to the v6 server and TSA is no longer in the picture. Now, let's see what happens when a IPv6 client wants to talk to IPv4 server, and this is without TSA. So without TSA, there's no interception of any kind. The v6 client makes the connect system call. The kernel responds, saying that it cannot reach the host, and connection fails, of course. So how can TSA come to the rescue here? So with TSA, uh, again, we intercept that connect system call, which was supposed to go to the kernel earlier, and now, the TSA figures out, hey, can I reach this um, v4 server from the container's namespace? It cannot, and then what it does is, it issues the connect call on behalf of the container. And the way it does that is, it, in another namespace, we have another v4 address, it leverages that to connect to the v4 server. So the result of this connect system call, as you guys know, is a file descriptor. So what it does next is what Kyle spoke about earlier, where Sargon added that facility to uh, change or mutate the file descriptor. So it replaces the file descriptor, the original file descriptor with this new file descriptor that it got from its own connect system call. And once it does that, right, the TSA gets out of the way and the communication between the V6 client and the V4 server is as if there was no TSA. 
So there's no per packet processing. There's a once in the lifetime of the connection, we do this mutation of the FT. And from then on, the packets between the client and the server just go uninhibited. So that's that's the value add here. So uh, that's all the talk of how um, this interaction works in DSA. Now over to Alok to do a demo for us. Look. Thanks, Keithy. Um, so let's move on to the demo. So uh, we'll be demoing how uh, TSA is able to connect to a v6 only uh, server using an IPv6 address. So we would be demonstrating how uh, TSA helps uh, your service uh, to connect to a v4 only. Uh, destination. So to start with, uh, let's say you've migrated your application to IPv6 only mode and um, you're uh, just exploring how the connectivity works to its dependencies. Uh, so to start off with, we have this container that's running uh, only IPv6. So we can confirm that using uh, the current network configuration. So we see that at zero, it only has uh, IPv6 address assigned. Uh, so uh, as it's obvious, uh, call like running a connect call to a v6 only server should work fine. So we'll just use curl uh, to show that uh, connections to v6 only uh, destinations work uh, as expected. So as we see, once we run this curl command, uh, it's able to connect to uh, this website using uh, the v6 mode. So now um, let's see if you try to connect to a v4 only server from this container, what happens? So if we run the curl command uh, using the hyphen four option, uh, so as Keithy mentioned, connecting to a v4 only server from a v6 only server would return an error, which is network is unreachable. So as you can see, uh, what could happen is as you move your applications to v6, uh, there could be certain dependencies that have not yet migrated to a v6 world, and uh, your connections to those services might start failing. So uh, next, let's see how TSA helps us in this regard. So now I'm switching over to a container that's running uh, with TSA to help connections go to the v6 only server. So again, uh, to confirm that we are just running uh, in v6 mode, so we run an IF config on net zero, uh, we see that we only have a v6 address here. Then, uh, and since we are running only in v6 only mode, uh, curl command to a v6 address should just work fine. Uh, so now when we connect to a v6 only destination, uh, we see that this works as expected. So now uh, just to confirm that we would be able to connect to a v4 only service using TSA, uh, I would just have uh, some other windows open to just show that uh, connectivity works via TSA. Uh, so I'll just start a S trace or a, a trace call on the TSA process that's running on the container host. Um, again, uh, I'll also be starting uh, a log on the ESA service itself. And uh, as Keithy mentioned, uh, TSA makes a connect to a V4 only service uh, via a V4 address. So what we do is we have like a uh, V4 only network space created uh, for the TSA to run in. So uh, this is the particular V4 only network namespace. So we have a, a interface aptly named as transit, which is actually used to transit to a V4 only service. So uh, just to confirm things work fine, uh, I'll start a TCP dump on port 80 on the interface transit. 
So uh, let's see what happens when we connect to a V4 only server from this V6 server. I'll run a S trace on the curl command to the V4 only server. So here we see uh, that we are successfully able to connect to a V6 only, uh, sorry, V4 only destination. We did make a connection to this V4 address uh, on port 80. When we show a S trace on the process TSA, uh, we see that TSA actually intercepted the connect call from the container and made a connect to the V4 only destination. And just for some extra confirmations, uh, this is a sequence of how TSA intercepts uh, syscalls from the container host. So we see uh, that TSA got a connect call from a process curl with these parameters. TSA then checks if a V4 route exists within the container's network namespace. So it figures out that there's no route to connect to that destination. It then, on behalf of the workload, it makes a connect call. And then uh, using the seccom BPF uh, uh, syscall, it mutates the original connect FD with this new FD, which was used to make to which was used to make a connect to the V4 only server. Uh, again, uh, TCP dump is another confirmation that uh, we were actually able to make a connect to this particular destination uh, over V4. So uh, that's all for the demo. Uh, I'll give this back to Keithy for the rest of the presentation. Cool. Thanks a lot. So all right, so that was the demo of how TSA is the transition mechanism so that we do the translation once in the lifetime of the connection. And once the um, uh, the, the file descriptors are mutated, um, uh, the TSA is out of the way and the packets go uninhibited. So TSA is not interacting with anything after the initial connection establishment. All right, so um, in terms of performance, uh, we don't have a lot of performance numbers. We're, uh, we're still working on getting these numbers. So on the left-hand side, I have like a happy path. The happy path is basically when um, we are trying to connect to, from a v6 client to a v6 server but what's important is we, get, we are intercepting every connect syscall so there is some amount of processing that tsa does and if you can see the the orange um, bar is where tsa is involved so there is some involvement of tsa right now with single thread so there is you know there's some performance impact we have we have to work on it uh, on the right hand side is the non-happy path or rather where the tsa is actually functioning it's swapping the file descriptors and I'm just running uh, curl uh, in a loop. And um, we see that there is performance impact in that uh, for about 1,000 curls, there is about six seconds of impact. Uh, for each connect call, we do, um, of course, do a bunch of other system calls just to enable um, connect to work, right? So um, there is impact. We're still working on the optimization. So the takeaway here from performance is, of course, there's an expected latency impact in the connection establishment but we expect that impact to kind of get amortized over the lifetime of the connection because of the number of packet exchanges and we don't do any per packet interactions. And internally, of course, we have a tool to also chart um, the differences calls we're uh, intercepting um, to get this whole transition mechanism in effect. So apart from the connect system call, we do intercept uh, send message calls also. And of course, VPF and perf event uh, calls are also being intercepted for various functions of the DSA uh, within Netflix infrastructure. And now talking about where we're going uh, with this in the future, um, when we were implementing um, the TSA, we came across a couple of fixes that uh, uh, need to be done within the kernel um, as part of maybe the extension of the ADFT support. And uh, Alok has been taking this up with the kernel folks. And um, eventually in Netflix, we'll be using the transition mechanism by default in production uh, as we migrate towards V6 and in the long term, um, the company will be IPv6 mostly everywhere. And, but we're talking to some third party services, which are probably IPv4 only, our TSA will get invoked. And all this will be seamless without the knowledge of the application engineer. So TSA will also continue to be used for uh, features like um, perf and BPF tools as Kyle was talking about. Yeah, so that's the, that's the wrap. So that's the presentation and uh, we're ready to take the questions. We can do questions and we also have a demo open still if you are curious or want us if you want a, a command from the audience for us to to run for you we'll do our best uh, but as as mentioned in the chat is this is an incomplete implementation it doesn't support everything you could possibly do 
with TCP and IPv4, mostly because we consider this a transition mechanism. We consider it to be like a backup. It's an auxiliary outbound IPv4 only for those things that need to connect to v4 uh, who haven't migrated to v6 yet. So it's it's kind of solving that chicken and egg problem where we want to be on IPv6 only, but we realize there's going to be some things that aren't ready to be IPv6. So this is that transition mechanism in, in action. All right, Daniel, let's go and then we can go back to the chat questions as well. Okay. So thanks a lot for the interesting work. Uh, I have two questions. Um, so question one is like, um, given you're, you're, you're giving the application an IPv6 socket and your goal is to not modify applications that, that exist to ease the transition, um, have you seen or experienced any breakages? For example, when they use set socket up, get socket up that are uh, IPv4 specific, but they have no support in v6 so first question is how um, have you seen anything like that and how do you handle this alec would you like to you've probably seen the most breakage from real, real world applications with epol uh sure uh so we did um sorry uh so we did see an issue where certain applications are um like once they create a socket, they actually save the socket in a epole structure before actually making the connect call. So uh, once we get this connect call and we get the socket FD uh, and we try to mutate it, uh, we are actually mutating it with a new file descriptor and the original file descriptor, which the application added to the epole is lost. So what we had to do in turn is before mutating the file descriptor, we had to actually go and figure out if the current socket which we are intercepting is part of uh, any epole structures in the original application. So uh, that's the additional part that we do uh, within the TSA. Uh, so that happens there. Uh, ideally, a good fix would be to do that uh, within the kernel, like walk all the file, uh, walk through all the file descriptors that are added to an epol structure by an original process and do a replacement there. Uh, so, but currently as a stopgap solution, we do this within the TSA. Uh, so uh, the errors mainly that we ran into were like once we mutated the file descriptor, the original application used to report that uh, it couldn't find the epol uh, monitored file descriptor. Um, yep. Yeah, um, I think that's the main issues that we have faced right now, like um, using TSA. Yeah, luckily, okay. luckily, you, we only need to build a solution for Netflix, so we don't have to support uh, every application under the sun, mm -hmm. and we only have to support the applications that are actually going to use this thing. And that means that you know, it's Netflix, Netflix's stacks, basically. Yeah. Uh, that that's how we're able to get away with such a thing. Okay, and uh, my second question would be, um, so I would assume the, T the TSA agent, uh, is it running in a separate network namespace or in the same as a process? Uh, I would assume a separate one, right? That's correct, yeah. yeah. So if it allocates a socket, it would be, the socket would reside in the TSA namespace and you hand the socket over into the target container namespace, right? Yep. Which would also have the impl implication that you couldn't see any traffic that was emitted from the application itself so like the troubleshooting might be more tricky to you so so how do you handle that yeah absolutely um in the demo you saw the the t speed up that was running from the shared namespace though not from the containers namespace it's true that when you run things like t speed up you don't see um you won't see the packets because they don't belong to your network namespace um Yep, that's absolutely a thing we think about. Um, we have other additional uh, network observability tools at Netflix that because we control them, we can augment them to be like TSA aware. But for the most part, we're kind of sucking it up and just thinking to ourselves, this is, you know, because it's a backup transition mechanism, we don't expect uh, applications to use this as their like primary connectivity. We're hoping that we can get away with kind of a less great troubleshooting experience. Um, and and be okay with it. Yeah. 
the TSA logs are pretty good. We made we made we made sure because we're debugging our own stuff that the TSA logs are are very clear about what's connecting to what and why and why it didn't work. Um, so those help a lot. But when it comes down to it, yeah, a, a person who's doing hardcore debugging is going to need to like TCP dump in two places. There was a question on whether we support UDP only or TCP only. Uh, hold on. Look, look, uh, maybe the moderator might might give. Yeah. So I think like the first one was the question from Toki about the performance uh, comparison to BPF based NAT64 solution. Toki, if yes, you want we, to expand. Yeah, we haven't done that performance thing yet. We I sure would like to. Um, one well, for one thing, we do know that when it comes down to it, it's hard to beat a non-translated IP. You know, the whole talk, this whole talk is you know, without NAT. These packets are not being translated. So if you're just raw, measuring raw like iperf, where there's just a connect, and then once you're there, it's just read and write, uh, the TSA is gonna be hard to beat. Now, that being said, the, the latency for transitioning these namespaces and doing the connect and all this like FD stuff, yeah, that's that's kind of sucky. So the latency is gonna, is gonna hurt. Um, Security had some numbers on the previous slide, but I we don't have any great numbers on like like throughput in comparison to the BPF Net64 thing. Um, yep, yeah, it's future work for us. Uh, so Dave has a bunch of remarks, Dave Taylor, about the UDP, TCP, and stuff like that. Dave, do you want to ask it in the voice? Fairly. Yeah. 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 So my question was, uh, since you can use connect on UDP, I imagine that your solution could actually work with connected UDP if the application does that. Have you tried that? Did you make it work with connect for both UDP and TCP? Or have you only tried to connect with the TCP path? Yeah, I think predominantly it's only been TCP. And the other thing, of course, in our favor is that, um, you know, we uh, in Netflix, we are predominantly TCP, but we do intercept uh, send message too. So that's um, with UDP. So the function of it's kind of, um, we try to be transparent whether we're handling UDP or TCP, but we do handle TCP predominantly. If you're yeah, part of the answer. reason that I ask is of course that uh, like quick is going to be doing you know, the, the replacement for TCP is over the top of UDP. And if you do connected UDP, then I imagine that you could have an upgrade path to quick fairly naturally. So. That's, that's right. Yes, yes, we are aware of that. Yeah. Um, one unfortunate side effect of how we've designed this is that quick using UDP, we are going to have to intercept every send message. So unlike the connect TCP use case, where once we do the connect, TSA is out of the picture, performance is line rate. With UDP, we have to intercept send message and, and receive message, and it's it's the performance is not going to be great on UDP. We're hoping that any performance sensitive UDP application is not going to use TSA and instead switch to either v6 only mode if they can or just do traditional v stack and that we'll just have to uh, live with that okay thank you it seems there is like a bunch of other remarks about like various different shortcomings and downsides to this uh, yeah. approach. So I don't know if anyone from like networking folks would like to summarize that, that would be great. Or you guys can, you know, you read the chat like you. you oh, might yeah, yeah. I can see. Yeah, like, we are we are extremely aware of how how uh, <laughs> how it's not that limiting, but like how how not comprehensive this solution is. But what we do like is the fact that this can be done um, you know, in theory, without changing people's applications. And um, the big idea here is that, you know, we don't have to do a dual stack for everybody. So now we have two, two IPs per container that we, we can't afford that. Um, and yeah, we don't really expect people to use this transition mechanism for fancy stuff like, you know, handing off the, the quick stuff, the you know, zero time, zero downtime stuff. This is only for outbound. You know, this is only for clients that need to connect to like GitHub v4, you know, for who knows what reasons. Because we control most of our applications at Netflix, if there's somebody who's not a V6 ready, we can just we can just ask them to be V6 ready so that we don't have to use this weird slow path um, and they can stay on V6 and be happy. And then, you know, we'll, I, I'm looking forward to the day that we can turn off TSA or turn off the, the, the network configuration of TSA where we can just do V6 only. We don't have to worry about this at all because we just live in that world. 
But to get there, we need this intermediate step. But yeah, it's definitely not a complete solution. Do you have any estimates when you will be like IPv6 only? Like, uh, do you have any plans? Yeah, just curious. Uh, yeah, from the progression of the slide that you saw earlier, uh, we've been making good strides towards that in, in terms of progress. And uh, there are various asks, even from our SDN um, that uh, AWS provides. So uh, again, uh, you know, the ballpark estimate would be uh, a couple of years, a few years from now, with BB6 only. Yeah, that high bar chart, the V6, you know, that, that chart you saw with the V6 flows, most of that came from being dual stack, not via TSA, I'm sad to say. Um, maybe in this next year, the majority of V6 flows will happen on V6 only containers. But uh, the, most of the progress that we've made on V6 today is because of dual stack. It's just that Netflix, we can't, we can't sustain dual stack forever. We just can't give away an IPv4 for every single container. And an IPv6. Rodrigo, do you want to ask this question? So Rodrigo is wondering like about if you replace the FD at the socket Cisco rather than connect, would it stay out of the way for UDP packets that use connect and send instead of send to? No idea what that means. I'm not networking <laughs> person. Mm, sure. So today we don't need to sub socket, um, the socket system call itself, but that's an interesting idea. We can definitely try it out here. So we would still have to like intercept the connect call again so that the connection could be made from the V4 only network namespace. Uh, so yeah, it'll, we would have to track socket FDs across uh, system calls to do that. Uh, so it would be uh, create a socket in the V4 namespace, uh, track it down till its uh, next connect call so that again, the connection could be made from the V4 namespace. So right now, yeah, as Alok was saying, the TSA is stateless uh, for obvious reasons. But uh, yeah, if we do that, if we do intercept uh, socket for whatever reason, we'll have to maintain some state. Dave, do you want to ask some more questions? Uh, sorry, I was in the middle of uh, typing. Uh, I think Rodrigo's suggestion about uh, hooking stuff at the socket layer uh, at the socket call, I mean, um, is I think what is uh, most consistent with the bump on the host RFC. So probably definitely something worth looking at. Um, the question that I was going to ask is, you know, on your bar chart, right, your trajectory just showed, if I remember right, just from February to August, you'd gone from uh, you know, zero percent IPv6 to twenty-five percent IPv6. If I remember the you know the top part of the graph, right? So my question is: at this trajectory, do you have any guesses right now as to whether you think you can pass fifty percent, or do you think you'll need to like change applications or do something else major to pass the uh, pass the fifty percent line? Was my question. Yeah, to get past that fifty percent line, we're gonna have to do probably two things. Um, we're gonna have to push really hard on our biggest applications who have lots of containers which again, may not necessarily correspond to the biggest applications. They're just the, the most prolific ones, batch jobs, things that are like launching lots and lots of stuff. Um, we're going to have to push really hard on them to adopt that. And luckily, we have good relationships. I, kind of unspoken behind the scenes here is um, um, we're actually on different teams. And one of the things, one thing I'm, I'm kind of proud to work at Netflix where we, we, don't, we don't, like Conway's law isn't so strong. So like we can, we can like, make friends and establish relationships and like convince the other teams that this is good for Netflix. And like, it's necessary for us to survive in the long term. Therefore, convince them to, to move their application to be on this network transition mode. Granted, it's weird, but it's gonna help us survive as we transition to V6 only. So we'll have, we'll have to really uh, ask and uh, uh, kind of like, get our biggest users on Titus to have faith that will take care of them from a network perspective if they can if we move to this kind of high performance 
um, IPv6 only scalability mode. Um, so handling those biggest applications. And then the second thing is we are like, as we ask them to move over, we need to make it really, really good. So we need to make it very, we need to increase the transparency to make it so that they're, they're very, it's very clear when something's not working and it's before. We need like the insight tools that we talked about. Uh, so that, that give and take to, to get us to pass 50%, it's gonna take a lot of um, convincing our fellow team members and you know, getting to actually use this thing. That's, that's what I think. I think it's a people problem at that point. I just want to say, cool. I love the fact that you've got from zero to twenty-five percent in you know, like six months or something. Awesome trajectory. Please, you know, keep it up. Let's see if we can keep moving that. I think the the world will love that. So, <laughs> thanks, thanks so much thank for presenting this. So, yeah, thank you. Um, so, keep in mind that these are internal Netflix numbers. I, I get that. Right. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, and you know, part of that is the power of a platform. So, Titus is really the key here. Like, we we have a platform where we have this this shim where we can uh, kind of influence the defaults and the recommendations and that sort of thing. Uh, that's the real power of, of having a, a shared platform that users use. Contrast to uh, like the traditional approach where everyone has like their own VM and they can kind of do whatever they want. We don't really have a hook. We can't like get in there and say, hey, here's the best practices. Here's what's best for Netflix at the network layer, that kind of stuff. But it's thanks to Titus that we can kind of inject these opinionated defaults and opinionated like things that can help push Netflix the org forward. Um, so that's the real magic is having a shared platform. Yeah, I guess my uh, last suggestion is, I think this is the sort of presentation and the work that you guys are doing. This is the sort of thing that I think that the uh, the IP, that the V6 Ops Working Group and the IETF would love to see presentations like that. So if somebody from Netflix is interested in, in, in doing that, um, I think this is the sort of thing that, that people love to see these sorts of discussions because um, at, Netflix is probably not the only organization in the world that's running into similar problems, right? And so being able to share learnings like this is exactly what the purpose of that working group is. And so we've seen a number of other presentations for similar but not the same types of problems and stuff and so if you'd love to do that i, I know the industry would love to hear more about this so again nice presentation thank you okay cool yeah we'll keep that in mind and uh maybe just uh i'll look up that that working group and see if we can get a slot and share yeah this is definitely an alternative approach to what a traditional enterprise might do with of course dual stack like is there another way this is definitely a, a weird way uh Eric also had a word of caution about avoid, like this this solution avoiding like uh, network bandwidth management, net NS based bandwidth management, and all stuff. Eric, if you want to expand on that thought, you have the mic, so go ahead. Well, no, that was just a general remark about uh, moderate management. Uh, Either a NetNS or C group uh, based, uh, so that that evasion might be something to consider in the future if you want to properly attribute uh, bandwidth to the container, uh, which really owns this FD, this socket. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, we do take in the normal networking modes. We do take a lot of we do a lot of work to make sure that containers are fair and that they can't. Uh, abuse and take up too much of the bandwidth and, and stuff. Um, and you're totally right that this transition network mode in the very nature of it being shared means that it's shared and potentially uh, opens it up for abuse. Um, yeah, definitely point taken. We, we must uh, protect it in some way to make sure that no bad actor can consume too much of that transit bandwidth. Yeah, but overall, uh, I, uh, I, need, I want to thank you for this uh, nice idea. It's, it's, uh, it's nice. Uh, just for the sake of connecting this to VPF in some way, right? Like I'll put my VPF hat on and I'm just wondering like, if you wanted to achieve the same with VPF, right? Like what, what's still missing from, from this, right? So like the, the sequence diagram, it's pretty involved, right? Like you, you transition between kernel and user space and all that stuff. Like if you wanted to either simplify or improve the performance of both, right? And like maybe even some of those limitations could be avoided if you do some more in kernel magic right from the bpf side like do you think like there is anything that uh, you know bpf can provide to to make this more universal i guess yeah it's, it's a great question the bpf nat64 implementation that i've seen um it
I mean, possibly. I think the 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 big deal I think is to actually have the ad FT support. Um, so of course you can intercept the connect system call. You, you can um, uh, you can try. So what we're trying to do is read another process's um, uh, uh, address space, right? So we're reading that and trying to figure out. Uh, where it needs to connect to, um, make a route check, and then eventually in the success part, we want to add that, call the add FT on the second system call. I think enabling all that under the hood, um, yeah. In, in so you, you can think about this the other way, right? Like right now you're reading user spaces memory, like just to get like the configuration, right? Like with the way that BPF normally works is actually you have in kernel data structure that's exposed to user space and user space actually maintains that and updates it and all that stuff, right? So both BPF side can read it. So in this case, like if you have some like lookup tables, you can actually like populate them in kernels, like through BPF maps, right? And then like all the logic will stay inside the kernel in your custom BPF program. So. Uh, Again, I'm not a networking person. I'm just saying that, you know, think about like how would you do it like with BPF. If you're not very familiar with BPF, then I guess it's just a good investment just to learn a little bit about that. Just shameless plug about BPF here. So. Uh, no, 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 totally. Uh, I, I think that that's one approach. I mean, we are slightly familiar with BPF, but um, it's not an approach we examined closely uh, because we had been running with the second bad FT since Sargon worked on the team. Uh, it's been a strategy to go in this direction, but definitely uh, uh, we should explore um, if this can be achieved from BPF. We, we have other initiatives that uh, use BPF programs to do socket lookups uh, within the team um, and to do network interception. So yeah, um, it's something that we can definitely explore, yes. So Dave Taylor was telling like more specifics about this uh, IETF group. Please check that in in the chat. I'm not going to repeat all that. Sorry. Yes, I think uh, the other thing is, of course, th th there's a team uh, within Netflix uh, that is driving the IPv6 migration. We're also being going to present the findings, our mi migration approaches and direction in reinvent this year. So definitely there is momentum in trying to showcase our efforts to move the entire enterprise to V6 completely, um, you know, and share it with the industry. Yes. Uh, 